Everybody here? Yeah. Carol, yeah. back row. Okay. Well, I guess we will go ahead and get started. Um, good evening. I'm Deb Smith. I'm the new executive director here at the library. I think I saw many of you at our last lecture. Um, and as you know, this is now the second in our series of six lectures this year. Um, so we're wonderf it's wonderful to have you here with us tonight. If you would like to come to the next lectures, we have a card at the back of the room here on the table, at the welcome table. You're welcome to take one of these. Um, mark your calendars, so all wonderful speakers that we have with us. I do want to say a special thank you to our staff and to our trustees and volunteers. Um, they make the evenings like this possible. I get to stand up here in front of you, but they really are the reason that we're here. Um, from going out to getting the, the wonderful desserts that we have at the back, setting up the chairs, putting the publicity together, getting the speakers, um, all of that makes these evenings possible. So I want to say thank you to our volunteers and our staff. Um, now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight. John Abel graduated from Central College of Kentucky and earned his MS and PH degrees from the University of Kentucky. And then since 1991, Dr. Abel has been at Randolph College where he is professor of economics and holds the Carl Stern Chair of Economics. While at Randolph, Dr. Abel has received the Gillis A. Leru, I think I pronounced that right, uh, Award for Outstanding Teacher, the Catherine Graves Davidson Award for faculty who have brought distinction to the college, and the Catherine Graves Davidson Scholarship Award. His recent research has focused on local economics, poverty, and food vulnerability. So his publications include a case study of inner city food deserts, I think you might have heard about those, um, in Lynchburg. And then his analysis of residential redlining in the city was published in the Virginia Social Sciences Journal. And he presented his findings at the Virginia Social Science Association's annual conference in 2019. I imagine that was right before uh, COVID, mm -hmm. sort of put a kibosh on conferences and that kind of thing. But he has recently co-authored a chapter on the government regulation of labor markets for the 2021 book, Inequality in America, Causes and Consequences of the Rich Poor Divide. So Dr. Abel is going to speak for about 30 minutes or so for us, and then we'll have plenty of time for Q&A afterwards. Um, but please join me in welcoming Dr. John Abel. All right, 30 minutes. We'll, we'll see what we can do about that. Uh, <laughs> I could do this one slide for 30 minutes and then move on to the next one for another 30 minutes. <laughs> uh, so we're going to talk about redlining. And this is a map, uh, let's see, I'm going to get my, on my devices here. Uh, so here's a map from which we get the notion of redlining. If I stand off of the mic, can you still hear me? Okay. So this is a security map, a Homeowner Loan Corporation security map from 1937. And it's a little early in our talk to get into the details of this. But you can see the areas that are red shaded. And Deb and I were talking before the um, start of our you know, presentation today that you know, in some cases, you may have had, uh, re you know, real estate agents literally with a, you know, blank map of the city and say, all right, pull out a red marker and we're going to draw an area that's going to be red line and, you know, we're going to encourage you not to move into that area or you're not allowed to live in that, that kind of thing. But the formal, you know, government sanctioned security maps, and we need to talk about why there were even such maps, uh, there was more shading rather than a line, and there was red, yellow, blue, and green shading. More on that, I promise you, to come. When I give talks on almost anything about Lynchburg, uh, I usually like to start with the following kind of what might just look like you know, dull, dry <coughs> statistics. But among the things I started following early on when I started researching about uh, local issues in Lynchburg was Lynchburg's poverty rate. And for a number of years, Lynchburg's poverty rate was above 20%. And it kept growing and growing and peaked above 25% around 2013 or so. It, just, it was sort of phenomenal to watch how high it grew. And if you think about that, if you've got a poverty rate of 25%, <coughs> you 
uh, you know, line up 100 people, 25 of them are going to be poor and missing meals. That's extraordinary, right? So you're looking at um, this uh, you know, plot here of the poverty rate in 2020, where now the poverty rate has fallen to 17.1%. So that's good. So we've had two years now, two years in a row, in which the poverty numbers have come down below 20%. So it's been on a downward trajectory. That's good news, OK? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't, almost doesn't matter what year I give a talk like this. I always can produce this bowl shape to uh, a comparison of Lynchburg versus other Virginia cities versus Virginia counties, overall Virginia and the United States. Virginia, for perhaps a host of reasons, not the least of which would be its uh, experience with redlining, more, more to come on that tends to always have a higher poverty rate than some of these other places, okay? Uh, part of that has to do with, you know, certainly when you compare Lynchburg versus the counties, the counties sort of divested themselves of city issues long ago, okay? Um, so let, let's recognize now that poverty is not equally distributed, okay? It's simply not equally distributed. So there's Lynch, Lynchburg's 17.1% poverty rate that I mentioned on the previous slide. Um, now, this is your first introduction, for some of you at least, to census tracts. So us researchers, uh, many of us, if we're concerned about things like income and poverty and uh, you know, housing and things like that, we fall on, uh, or we, we draw upon the US census uh, and use their census tract data. So a census tract is a geographic region established for the collection of census data. So FYI, where we're standing right now, we're in census tract 8.01 for what that's worth. And so you see here I've got the highest poverty rate in census tract 11, which also coincides with uh, Diamond Hill. You may think of Diamond Hill, perhaps some of you, as being you know, the Washington Street, Pearl Street quarter. There's way more to it than that. And because of that, way more to it than that part, that gives you 38.7% poverty. Whereas out in Boonesboro, <coughs> Boonesboro is 4.6% poverty. So that's kind of like the, the good and the bad of Lynchburg's poverty. And again, that, that unequal distribution is in a world of falling poverty rates, okay? Now, that distribution continues when you move to the topic of race, all right? So I've got red for black, blue for uh, white. Uh, if we were in, you know, maybe out in the Southwest, we would be worried about uh, perhaps Asian and Hispanic. The, the main racial divide here in Lynchburg, for the most part, is uh, white and black. And I don't mean to dismiss any other race, but that's where much of the focus is. So when you look at overall Lynchburg, comparing it to uh, other Virginia cities, the black-white poverty uh, distribution is as such, 24.4% black, 12.9% white, and remember that. The, the, the number in the middle, the overall uh, Lynchburg number is 17.1. Remember that? Now, under 18, this is kind of like your future, uh, future group of people who are going to be in poverty. Those are under 18, right? So Lynchburg, 38.5% uh, black are impoverished, and, and that's certainly higher than Virginia cities. Notice, though, that for white poverty, uh, Lynchburg is actually less than Virginia City. So, again, another... Uh, instance of the unequal distribution of poverty here in uh, Lynchburg. Now, there's a historical context to a lot of this. There's a legacy, as I say here, of past racial injustices that carry forward through time to affect the well-being of those living in the present. That's almost, but not quite, a quote from one of my favorite authors, Ta-Nehisi Coates, uh, writing uh, in The Atlantic back in 2014. Now, the real estate redlining of the 1930s offers a lens through which we might make a connection between the racism of the past and the poverty of the present. So again, you, you may think I'm kind of whizzing past this map. We're going to talk about this map here soon enough. So redlining, again, we're talking about the 1930s, all right, took place against the colliding forces of the Great Depression and the virulent racism of the 1930s. So first slide here looks mainly at the uh, Great Depression. So the Great Depression of the 1930s was, it was a cataclysm, the, the likes of which our country had never seen. Uh, output of goods and services, the kind of stuff that economists worries about, that was reduced by one third. Th think about the, the present economy shrinking by a third. 
or, or any of you losing income by a third. That's a bunch, right? Stock flight prices, of course, plummeted. Everybody knows that story. 9,000 banks went out of business. 9 million savings accounts were wiped out. Mm. That's just horrible, right? It's, you know, it's before the days of uh, you know, FSLIC and FDIC, all that good stuff that you know, we just sort of take for granted today. 86,000 businesses failed. Wages decreased by an average of 60%. Uh, hard times, as Stud Turkles once put it. Now, so this collision of the Great Depression and the racism of the 30s. So leading up to the 30s, a lot of the hard-earned rights that blacks had acquired in the aftermath of the Civil War, those rights were just sort of frittered away, right? Uh, those rights had come with the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, the so-called Civil War Amendments. And a lot of people don't even know these Civil Rights Acts exist, but there was three Civil Rights Acts, count three, uh, and most people don't, don't even know they exist. Everybody thinks 18, uh, 1964, but there are three of them. Most of those got swept away uh, by the end of Reconstruction in 1877, uh, and the infamous, most people don't know about this one either, the infamous 1883 Supreme Court ruling that basically said that the social rights that those civil rights acts had ensured were not in fact civil rights, and <coughs> Congress was powerless to legislate on the conduct of private individuals. So much of our legislative efforts for the next hundred years or so were to chip away at this infamous 1883 ruling to finally sort of rein in some of the private sector actions that were, you know, disenfranchising blacks. Uh, and, and the government, of course, had, had its own issues here, which we'll talk about very soon. <coughs> so losing all those rights, it, it, it was a terrible thing for blacks. So we started into about 70 years of rigid segregation under the black codes and Jim Crow laws. Um, and so let's think about what's going on here. You've got the end of the Civil War. White folks in the South, they didn't like the outcome of that war. They, they, they just did not like that. They, they lost their labor force, and they began looking for any way possible to sort of regain that labor force, and they tried to do it with force, okay? So I would invite any of you to read this book by Douglas Black, Slavery by Another Name. So there was this sort of ingenious effort uh, in the aftermath of the Civil War to try to put blacks back in their place, to try to get them back on the plantation or in the foundry or the factory <coughs> or in the mines or whatever. And so a bunch of legislation got passed in all the southern states that said, if you're going to be on the streets of whatever city, you had better have a, a letter of some sort declaring that you are gainfully employed and who, who are you employed by, right? You can't just be on the streets uh, you know, a free black man. You're free officially according to uh, the 13th Amendment, but not a, according to, you know, the Southern, you know, view of things. So, you, you know, you've got vagrancy laws, uh, these so-called black codes, and so the, the factory owners, the foundry owners, the miners, the, the plantation owners, they quickly realized that they could take advantage of those laws, and so uh, suppose you, you need some cheap labor. You call up the sheriff and say, I need some more folks here to, to work my plantation or work in my mine or whatever. And so they basically go out and, you know, beat the bushes a little bit, find some people, uh, you know, on the streets without evidence of employment, haul them into jail. They can't, of course, afford to pay the fines. Who's standing in line willing to pay their fines? The plantation owners, the foundry owners, the factory owners, the mine owners. They're willing to pay that fine, and now they actually have access to their labor services for X amount of time, for a couple of years, maybe three years or so. And uh, th so they'll pay off the fine that is owed to the government, you know, owed to the sheriff's office or whatever, but now that gives them essentially ownership of those black folks to, to work in the mines and what have you. And because now they are no longer the possessions of the owners, right? Well, they're, they're sort of the possession, but not like slavery. If you're gonna pay $800, say, to buy a slave back in 1860 or 1850 or whatever, you've gotta take at least a little bit of care of these folks to, to make sure they got enough food to you know, live to another day to do their work for you. If these folks didn't last but a year or so in the mines, just call up the sheriff and you get another round of them, okay? 
life was really tough and it lasted for 70 years or so. This went on well into the uh, 20th century. That's just this one issue alone, convict labor, convict policing is what I'm describing. There was a loss of the right to vote. You got to sit in the back of the trolley or bus, drink from coloreds only water fountains, lack of access to decent uh, housing or schooling. Blacks were run out of entire counties or towns or massacred. We recently had the 100th anniversary of the massacre in Tulsa just a couple of years ago, Forsyth County. Every black was run out of the county back in 1912. Uh, there's a whole book written about that. Uh, Phillips, I believe, is the guy's, author, the guy's name who's the author. A lot of uh, towns were known as sundown towns where blacks were simply not allowed to appear. Uh, James Lowen, the sociologist James Lowen, wrote a whole book about that. You can check that out. This is probably the most remarkable thing. This shows you the tenor of the 1930s. There was the, the famous Dyer, that was the name of a politician, Dyer, the anti-lynching bill that had passed in the House in the teens, the 19-teens. It could not get passed in the Senate. It kept getting filibustered. They finally just gave up on it in 1937. So people like Theodore Bilbo of Mississippi would just keep filibustering these things. And so people were willing to go on record in the Senate that said, I'm okay by casting my vote this way. That it's okay to uh, engage in the extrajudicial killing of another human being. Mm -hmm. It's just remarkable that people would go on record with a vote like that. This is the 1930s. So where's Lynchburg's place? Lynchburg's place in this history. So Lynchburg was a slave trading entrepot city with a formal slave market at 9th and May. An entrepot city, an entrepot pro anything is a location, usually think of it as a city, where trade takes place. Usually you're talking about exporting and importing. So we're, in the case of slavery, we're talking about the movement and the trade of slaves from places like Baltimore and Richmond toward places further south and west. And Lynchburg was in the middle of all that trade. So you might have uh, this you know, vibrant market at 9th and May, Maine. Maybe people were buying slaves to own you know, here in Lynchburg itself, to, to be hired out, right? I, you, know, you, you know, any of us back then could have been a slave owner, you would have owned that slave, and you would have had that slave actually go work maybe in a shoe factory or tobacco warehouse or something like that. So Lynchburg was a, a, a bustling place within the slave trade. And at the outbreak of the Civil War, 42% of the population actually consisted of slaves. That's a significant population percentage and 40% of the white population owned or hired, excuse me, at least one slave. That's about 20 percentage points more than the average uh, white uh, you know, person or, or you know, family <coughs> in other parts of the South. So Lynchburg was a very active uh, trade uh, community for slavery. Now, before the Civil War, Lynchburg you see this statistic a lot, was considered to be the second wealthiest city in the United States on a per capita basis. Tobacco wealth for sure, absolutely. But the industry would not have been profitable without Lynchburg's slave labor force. So the average market value of a slave in 1860, you see this number a lot, was $800. Uh, in today's dollars, there's a wide range of estimates. Uh, many of them are in the forty to $50,000 range with some researchers suggesting a valuation as high as 184000 I've even seen some that go up into the millions of dollars of valuation when you put it in today's dollars. So if you think about that, it's not as extraordinary as it might seem. Uh, surely you wouldn't want to pay $800 for a slave back in 1860 if that slave wasn't going to bring in for you $800 worth of uh, you know, profit or whatever. If you're going to pay, say, $184,000 for a piece of say, John Deere equipment, you would hope that, that would bring in you know, some farm profits in the range of 184000 So these, you know, somewhere in this range suggests that, you know, whatever number is accurate, it's clear why the South in general, or Lynchburg in particular, would not readily let go of this highly profitable, and this is the language others have used, peculiar institution, all right? Well, wait a minute. What was going on in that picture? Uh, they're processing tobacco. That, that's a tobacco oh. warehouse. Oh, okay. Yeah, they're, they're kind of braiding and processing tobacco. So, uh, and I think that's also a tobacco warehouse in this subsequent picture here. 
So further about Lynchburg now, M move from the slavery era into the Jim Crow era, and we're talking about the Plessy versus Ferguson uh, ruling in 1896, the so-called separate but equal. And for blacks, things certainly were separate, but they were not equal. They just were not. They had to, blacks had to sit in the back of streetcars, uh, drink from colored-only water fountains, attend segregated schools. Could they go to the public pool? No. Uh, access to the privately funded Jones Library? No. <laughs> access to the lunch counter at Patterson's Drugstore? No. No, no, no. Segregated neighborhoods, as you will see here. So back to the 1930s and kind of this collision of uh, race and, and the Great Depression. So there was a, an increase, increased use of race-based zoning laws to protect white property values. Blacks were left to the, the vicissitudes, the uncertainties of the rental market stuck in the urban core of most cities. Owner-occupied housing was affordable primarily for well-to-do whites. Anybody wanting to buy a home back then didn't have the kind of loan features that you have today. Uh, you would have probably had to put about half of the uh, value of the property down in the form of a down payment, and you would have paid a very high interest rate, and then that loan would have come due with like a bubble payment uh, in five to seven years, and then if you couldn't pay it off, you would probably have to renegotiate your loan not many people could do all that. Okay, so it was mostly whites. Blacks who had been the last hired were now the first fired to preserve jobs for whites. And the unemployment rate back then was officially 25%, but for blacks, estimates show that it was 50%. Evictions were just huge. People were losing access to their, their homes at about 1,000 a day. There were foreclosures. And the housing and construction markets were just in free fall. The whole economy was in free fall. So the government came to the rescue, and I emphasize for some. So you had the Home Under Loan Corporation, Hulk, as I will come to refer to this. It was created to assist existing homeowners, right? Homeowners who faced foreclosure. And it provided them with new, longer term, fully amortizing mortgages, the likes of which we still have today. So you could expect to get some you know, government guaranteed loans uh, that, you know, maybe we're at a minimum 15 years, maybe even out to 20 or even 30 years. Uh, and because the government was playing a sort of a, a backstop role, you have lower interest rates. And that was for existing homeowners. The FHA was created about a year later in uh, 1934 to help actually make homeownership available to the broad middle class. So uh, creating loans from scratch to facilitate new home ownership. All right. Um, so with Hulk and the FHA providing billions of dollars to prop up such a sizable portion of the economy, this kind of makes sense, actually, that they would do what they did. They felt compelled to appraise the stability of the neighborhoods in which they were making such substantial investments. Sounds like a prudent thing to do. But it's at this point now, this appraisal process, where these seemingly hopeful government actions became or become controversial. So, <coughs> There was not the kind of appraisal industry that we have today. You just you know, call up somebody and say, hey, I, can you appraise my home? Um, so the government, wanting to appraise the stability of these neighborhoods where they were going to make all this investment, who should they call on to do the appraising? Well, call on the, the people that know the neighborhoods the best. Call on the local realtors. So they did. And a lot of those realtors had signed on to the National Association of Real Estate Board's Code of Ethics. This is 1924 now. A realtor should never be instrumental in introducing into a neighborhood members of any race or nationality whose presence will clearly be detrimental to property values in that neighborhood. That's just right there in their code of conduct. Now, so try to imagine then being a local real estate agent uh, that Hulk or later FHA hires to go out and assess a neighborhood. What's the stability of this neighborhood? You go out with your clipboard in hand, you're given a check sheet that looks like this, with uh, Hope referred to as an area description. Now, I know you can't read this, but I'm going to give you a blow up of parts of it here. And you're to go out there and collect all this information. Things, obvious stuff like, you know, terrain, you know, is, is it hilly, is it flat? You know, what's the quality of the home construction? You know, is it brick, is it wood? But then they get into all these detailed, uh, what today seem pretty inappropriate questions. And maybe you can see this. I hope maybe you can see this one, if that's blown up enough. So it's, 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 segments of that, that same previous area description. So name of city, Lynchburg, security grade. This gets a D rating, the worst rating. This is going to be a red line neighborhood. 
area number 10. Uh, this is um, uh, Diamond Hill. Couldn't think of it for a second. It's Diamond Hill, or portions of today's Diamond Hill. <coughs> so the inhabitants, the type, the labor, estimated family income, $500. Foreign born, uh, not a lot of that here in Lynchburg. Negro, they're asking specifically about Negro. Right? Don't just fill in the blanks. Mm -hmm. We're looking for Negroes. And we want to say yes or no answer. And what's the percent? You know what they're interested in here. Yeah, they've got to ask about terrain and income. This is what they're really interested in here. And they're worried about infiltration. But And, and it's interesting when you go look at the uh, mapping inequality site. Mapping inequality from where I get a lot of this information. Uh, it's this consortium of researchers at the University of Richmond, Virginia, and Maryland who have uh, found all those uh, security maps and put all this information together. Um, for some places, you'll see all this redundancy here. The type of inhabitants in some cities, there'll be Negro. Negro, yes, infiltration of Negroes. And of course, relief families, uh, the answer in the 1930s is gonna be many, right? It's the 1930s, yes, there's many relief families. Um, it's almost interesting when you compare all these area descriptions for Lynchburg to a place like Chicago or Philadelphia or whatever. And again, any of you could go the minute you leave uh, here tonight and go to the mapping inequality site and start looking at all this yourself. Some of these appraisers just got downright vitriolic, racist, nasty remarks, and, and maybe their concerns weren't so much uh, blacks or Negroes, maybe they were worried about Poles or Jews or whatever. They're, all these concerns in other places. Um, and when you look at this one here, th this is not atypical. They didn't have a lot to say about Lynchburg. I don't know if they were, everything was just sort of hunky-dory here, or if they were bored. I, I, don't, I don't know what the deal was, but they, they had the chance for clarifying remarks. They could talk about infiltration. They just didn't have much to say. So we've got sort of spare data for Lynchburg here. So, but you're getting to the heart of the matter of redlining right here. The, these three areas right here. The availability of mortgage funds. Notice that there's, the answer here is none. For home purchase or home building, none. <coughs> if there's going to be no chance of availability of mortgage funds, then that's going to pretty much guarantee you're going to get a security grade of D rather than A. Okay? The fact that there's 100% Negroes, that's going to guarantee that you get a D rather than an A. <coughs> and I guess this overall designation as being hazardous. So this is a hazardous neighborhood here. Mm. Okay. No clarifying remarks. There, in fact, there's only two or three neighborhoods in the whole city where there was any clarifying remarks at all. All right, so to the map now. I keep talking about this map. Finally, I've got a little commentary on the map. So here we are right here. We're, where we're standing and listening and talking right here at the Jones Memorial Library. Uh, and we're adjacent to this uh, yellow shaded uh, Hulk, Home Loan Corporation, neighborhood C1 right here. Okay? Um, running through right there, I guess that's Fifth Street or Memorial, <coughs> right there where my uh, laser is moving. Uh, Diamond Hill that I keep referring to, the red shaded part of Diamond Hill is right there. Famous Washington Street, Pearl Street corridor is right there. That's part of the yellow shading. Uh, where my current school, which used to be called Randolph Macon Women's College, it's up there in the uh, blue uh, shaded neighborhood along Riverwood Avenue. Now, what, what did the uh, folks at Hulk do with all this information that they collected from all those area descriptions? They compiled it and they, uh, you know, concluded that if a neighborhood is if it's 100% black, we're going to deem it to be hazardous. It's going to become red. If there's a uh, neighborhood that's in decline or transition, probably because of its proximity to the black uh, neighborhoods, the red shaded neighborhoods, that's going to be given yellow shading or C designation. Then further out are the blue and the green, right? The further away you are from the red shaded, uh, you know, uh, Negro communities, then you get into the B and the A, the still desirable and the best neighborhoods. They literally referred to the A graded uh, neighborhoods as being the best people. Did, did you have a question, sir? What year was that? 1937. Okay. 1937. Um, so um, 
That's, so that's where those colors come from. The colors come from all that information and those area descriptions. Okay? Now, I want to, let me, let me kind of toggle back and forth here. So back to this map right here for a second. Notice that you've got red and yellow kind of all interspersed. That really makes it difficult for a researcher like me to use modern census tract data to try to figure out what's going on in today's world in terms of things like poverty, income, and what have you. Um, if you were to go to other cities, Baltimore comes to mind. Baltimore almost fits what you might think you would find if you were to say, all right, here's what I think I would find if I went to the Mapping Inequality site. There you'd find an inner city that's almost entirely ridge shaded, then more of, of an outer perimeter that's yellow, and then blue, and then green. And you can kind of uh, easily put those you know, red shaded neighborhoods in Baltimore and match them up with you know, specific census tracts. It's almost impossible to do that right here. Now I'm gonna come back to the dilemma that that poses for me. But the other thing to note here is you've got a lot of intermixing of white and black. The yellow communities, with four exceptions, were almost 100% white. There were three of those yellow shaded neighborhoods in which there were five to 10% black. And then there was one that encompasses most of Deerington, the Deerington neighborhood, which is uh, right there, um, which I believe was 30% or either 30 or 33% black. I was actually kind of surprised that uh, that didn't get uh, labeled as a, uh, a red shaded neighborhood. They seem to have the parameter though, if it's 100% black, it's, it's gonna be red shaded. Anything else will, will probably get some yellow shade or other. Um, so let's, let's sort of focus in then on a neighborhood here. So everybody knows about the Ann Spencer Hub. If, if you're here in Lynchburg, you've all heard of the Ann Spencer Hub. This is where Ann Spencer lived back in, in this time. She lived in one of these red shaded neighborhoods. And again, this happens to be the Diamond Hill neighborhood. So here on Pierce Street, her, uh, you know, the income, the average income in her neighborhood was $500. All uh, Ann had to do was walk, uh, what would that be, north, uh, west, about two blocks, and she's suddenly in a neighborhood where they make nearly five times what they make <coughs> in her neighborhood. Or walk two blocks south where they make nearly twice uh, what they make in her neighborhood. So, but within, uh, you know, one of the red shaded neighborhoods or red light neighborhoods, that was 100% black. But again, we're not talking about apartheid South Africa kind of segregation. You know, there was nothing really to keep, you know, Anne, you know, cloistered in her little neighborhood there. Now, I've got this slide specifically so that we don't forget the role of the FHA and the VA. There was a story in NPR recently, just yesterday, a driveway moment, as they say, where I was listening to this story about uh, uh, black uh, soldiers returning from World War II who didn't, they were not able to participate in the GI Bill. There was just all this racism that awaited them. They'd gone to fight for, for the cause of liberty, but they didn't find that when they came home. So what they found when they came home, uh, along with you know, anybody trying to apply for an FHA uh, home, was that there was a whites only requirement, okay? So this is official government rulemaking here, right? making racial segregation an official requirement of the Federal Mortgage Insurance Program. So there's an underwriting manual, first issued in 1935, that instructed appraisers to give higher ratings where protection against some adverse influences is obtained, and that import among adverse influences are infiltration of inharmonious racial or nationality groups. They were very specific as to what they were worried about and what they wanted to keep out. So, uh, in one of my favorite books by Richard Rothstein, The Color of Law, he speaks of de jure uh, racism, de jure segregation, uh, and de facto. So, uh, Levittown, maybe many of you have heard of Levittown, okay? Uh, one of the very first subdivisions, kind of track home subdivisions in, in Long Island. So Mr. Levitt uh, and, and his family, was he racist? Or was he merely a product of the culture of his day? The answer to both those questions is probably. If that's all that we had to deal with, that would be de facto, right? That's not official government. I mean, that's just Mr. Levitt being maybe a racist. But the only way Levittown would get built, we're talking about a gigantic subdivision, really huge, was with federal loan guarantees, right? So 
banks would be willing to bankroll this whole giant subdivision if they had some guarantees from the federal government. Once you make that guarantee, that just opens up all those money doors and the money comes rolling out and you can start building about one home a day at that point. So the, F the VA and FHA provided those guarantees only under very specific conditions that the subdivision be whites only. That's de jure racism or segregation. And again, further evidence of de jure uh, discrimination, segregation, racism is that the Supreme Court in the Corrigan versus Buckley ruling of 1926 said, oh, that's okay, right? Racially restrictive covenants, covenants, they're legally binding. It's okay to do this. Here's the famous clause 25 in the Levittown uh, rental agreement here. The tenant agrees not to permit the premises to be used or occupied by any person other than members of the Caucasian race. All right, all quaint, right? That's, that's Long Island. That's, that's, that went on elsewhere. But all you gotta do is go down to the Lynchburg City Court Clerk's Office, fish around for an hour or so, and you'll find all that same stuff here. So that neither said lot nor any portion thereof shall be sold, leased, or otherwise disposed of, except persons of Caucasian descent. Deed recorded in uh, 1940 in the Lynchburg City Court Clerk's Office. There's lots of these. Don't have to look hard. Uh, no lot is to be sold, leased, or disposed of to any person of African descent. And on top of that, they, they can't have double protection here. Toss in some uh, uh, financial limitations here. You cannot sell the lot uh, at any price less than $6,000. That's going to also keep a whole class of people from being able to buy this property here. Again, okay, recorded in 1947 in the Lynchburg City Court Clerk's Office. So one of the impacts of all this redlining and all these racially restrictive covenants, it basically locks people into this urban core. It cemented that urban infrastructure into place for what would be decades to come. So the result of all that cementing into place, all that infrastructure, is a lack of mobility, increased poverty, diminished economic opportunities, diminished home values. You can go around the uh, 13th, 14th <coughs> Street part of Lynchburg here, and this five bedroom rooming house right here, I could take you to it, that's gonna be there for decades to come. That's not gonna get knocked down anytime soon. Nobody's eager to repair the, the flooring on the uh, deck here, right? Uh, five families live there, I think it's mostly single people, sharing one bathroom and one kitchen that I don't think even has a, a refrigerator, if I'm not mistaken about that. Uh, so that's some of your urban in infrastructure sort of locked into place. People live right there in kind of a shack without any running water, electricity, or anything. This is part of what gets locked into place. And so this is a great quote from this book, Oliver and Shapiro, Black Wealth, White Wealth. Locked out of the greatest mass-based opportunity for wealth accumulation in American history, African Americans who desired and were able to afford homeownership found themselves consigned to central city communities where their investments were affected by the self-fulfilling property prophecies of the FHA appraisers. Cut off from sources of new investment, their homes and communities deteriorated and lost value in comparison to those homes and communities that FHA appraisers <coughs> deemed desirable. So back to Diamond Hill. Here's the Washington Street quarter right here, an example, one of the finer homes there. You've got some that are as, uh, you know, in bad shape as that one right there. You've got, you've got property values ranging from $2,500 all the way up to $607,000 and some change. Uh, the mean and the median are in here at 75 dollars or 51000 That's not an atypical looking uh, Diamond Hill property right there. Okay. Now, to be able to move us along toward the end here, I wanted to show some current data beyond those poverty numbers that I shared with you. So if you take that red lining map, or the security map, and you, you uh, orient it on its proper axis with north and south running up and down on the, on the picture here, uh, I've had it oriented the other way until now. Now I've got it oriented north and south. And so you lay it over the Lynchburg city map right here, and you realize that Lynchburg's had lots of rounds of annexation and expansion over the years. And so this area that was red line, yellow shade, and all that, 
was you know a, a portion of today's Lynchburg. Okay, so this was sort of vexing to me. How to study what happened long ago? It, it wasn't as convenient as, as Baltimore, like I talked about earlier. Baltimore, I could easily take that whole downtown area that was redlined, just go straight to a bunch of census tracts, and I've, I've got a study going. What do I do with all that? It suddenly dawned on me, and I almost just tossed aside the whole research project for a while. And I realized that a lot of the problems that afflicted the red line neighborhoods also affect the yellow shaded neighborhoods as well. All right? uh, things like commercial properties and industrial properties were specifically located in neighborhoods like this. They weren't allowed out in the Boonesboro area, not much out in the uh, West End and Fort Hill area, just beyond that direction you know, from where we are right here. Uh, but all that stuff was allowed right here. Okay, So once I got past my hang-up that I couldn't study exactly uh, the red line neighborhoods. Why? Because there is no census track. There, there's a diamond hill right there. There's no census track that consists of that piece of that red line area right there. But there are census tracks, about five of them, that encompass that whole area. Once I got my head wrapped around that, I was kind of off to the races being able to study all this stuff. So what, what does the population look like in those three areas? Okay, well, Lynchburg as a whole is 61.4% white, 27.2% black, um, and you've got Asians and Hispanics as well. It's always interesting that the West End area, again, that area out that direction past the library, out Fort Hill, always, in almost every category, whether it's poverty, income, whatever, almost looks exactly like the average for Lynchburg. It's like Lynchburg is the West End in, in some respects. But then, of course, you've got Boonesboro at one end with 84% white, 7% black. And you've got this so-called urban core consisting of those five census tracts, census tract four, Daniels Hill, six, College Hill, seven, uh, Deeringson, uh, 11, uh, we keep talking about over and over, is uh, uh, Diamond Hill, and then uh, 19 is uh, uh, White, White Rock, right? White, White Rock Hill, James Crossing, and all that. So in the urban core, as I'm referring to it, almost 60% black. So kind of a, quite a reversal here from the Boonesboro to the urban core in terms of population. Now, back to that poverty. Uh, analysis that we had going on. Let's focus on youth poverty, and let's focus on that urban core, those, those five census tracts there. All right. So remember, Lynchburg had that 17% overall poverty. Now let's focus on youth poverty, and let's focus on it in the areas that were both red and yellow line long ago. Okay. So black youth poverty soars up above 50%, 56.1%. White youth only 19.9% and overall youth is 43.5, that's a lot of kids in poverty here in Lynchburg in this particular part of the, of the community, okay? Um, so you, you line up 100 kids, 100 black kids in the urban core, 56 of those 100 kids are gonna be poor. All right, that's a remarkable number. And this is in an era of improving numbers. These, are, these numbers have been improving for several years now. Now, this, we're moving toward the end. Uh, Deborah, do I still have a, a minute or two? Or do I? Yeah, sure. Okay. We, we now get into the most recent research that I've done. I've, I've got a, a paper which I actually, you, you folks are the first ones to ever hear this. But mm -hmm. I shared it with my students. You're not literally the first ones, but the first people in a community setting. Uh, I've not shared this in an academic setting. So, you know, usually you reserve this stuff for some fancy, uh, you know, academic uh, conference or whatever. So you guys are the first to hear about my recent research. So one of the things I realized, and I should probably go back, let me go back if I can, to return to this slide here. <coughs> okay. So back to this issue here of the red and the yellow just sort of all being interspersed, making it difficult to pull out a <coughs> census tract that describes any of that. Well, all I, realized, I suddenly realized that if I go to the city assessor's office and go to their parcel viewer, and any of you could do this, you could do it, like pull out your computer right now and do this. Mm -hmm. You can go out there and you've got this most clever GIS software that allows you to, with your mouse cursor, 
to just start drawing a boundary around, say, the Diamond Hill neighborhood. And once you've drawn that boundary, then you go out, kind of like I like to say, you hit the go button, and you're going to download all the property values within the, the boundary that you just drew. It's the most powerful, interesting software. And so now, at least for this one area, uh, real estate assessed values. I can't do it for poverty, I can't do it for income, but for real estate values, I can be very precise and talk about today's real estate values in neighborhoods that were red lined or that were yellow lined, and I can be very precise with them. And most researchers don't have that precision available to them. I think we're very fortunate to have this kind of software at our disposal here in Lynchburg. So back to this slide right here. So summar summarizing over all of those uh, rated or graded neighborhoods, the, the colored uh, neighborhoods here, you see that the A shade, the A uh, rated neighborhoods, the green uh, shaded neighborhoods, have an assessed home value of 168,000. Now you may say, wait, how come people aren't just scooping up these properties? Well, those are not market values, right? These are assessed values. And you probably are actually hoping that your assessed values don't quickly arrive at your market values, right? You'd not be happy about that. So they tell you, though, at the assessor's office that they're always moving in that direction. So someday, your uh, tax assessed value will approach your market value, but there's, there's usually a lag, OK? So more important for our purpose is not do these numbers represent the market value that you would find from you know, playing around on Zillow, but what they do is they allow us to compare the, you know, the green shaded versus the red shaded, right? So you can see that at the top end, uh, Lynchburg uh, has assessed home values. These are single family homes, <coughs> 168,000, 528 for the original red line or uh, red shaded uh, D neighborhoods. Uh, what is that? Uh, about a four percentage uh, point difference there. And, and again, here's Lynchburg overall at 138.7. So it's kind of in the middle of all these. Okay. Mm -hmm. So all those homes that were in the yellow and the red shaded areas, their values have been beaten down pretty significantly over the years. All that cementing into place that I talked about, right? The commercial properties. You know, you, you read in Rothstein's book, uh, you know, city fathers long ago wanted to make sure that we keep the races separate. We're not going to allow, you know, houses of prostitution or, or anything like that in the white neighborhoods, but we'll allow that stuff in the black neighborhoods, okay? Not going to be any auto shops out in, in the Boonesboro area, but we'll allow those, you know, in the black neighborhoods, those kinds of things. So those sorts of things help to account for some of these differences here. I think I've got a couple of slides that maybe get specific here. Uh, so for example, uh, you see that homes in the D or red shaded neighborhoods are much smaller than homes in the A or the green shaded neighborhoods, right? Uh, so folks living out in the Boonesbury area uh, have at least 600 extra square feet per, per house, okay? Um, here's another one. Uh, maybe I never thought about this. Vacant parcels are an indicator of sort of how vibrant a neighborhood is. The more vacant parcels you have, usually you're talking about neighborhoods that have lower assessed values, uh, greater poverty. And so in the D-shaded, uh, or I'm sorry, the red-shaded neighborhoods, 61.5% of all single family, or I'm sorry, I'll put it this way, vacant parcels as a percent of single family parcels, 61.5%. Only 7.9% uh, vacant parcels uh, as a percent of single family parcels out in the Boonesboro area. Um, so you just you don't drive around Boonesboro and see many vacant parcels. You, you do here in the red shaded neighborhoods. Now we're close to the end, believe it or not. So one of the things that you might think about from uh, my profession as an economist, what does economic theory say about any of this? If a value gets pushed down so much, say stocks, maybe now could be a really good time to buy stocks. Some people would tell you that. That's not stock advice. Don't rush out and buy stocks. <laughs> but suppose stocks have been beaten down. Now would actually be a good time to buy stocks if that were true, right? Well, if home values have been beaten down to that little amount right there, and that's actually on the uptick, right, after a couple of years, right? We've been in this frenzy pace of home buying and, and home price escalation. You're, you're aware of all this, right, for the past couple of years? 
this is actually a higher number now as a result. All right, so if you were a betting person, where do you think has been the fastest growth or home appreciation in Lynchburg in the past couple of years? What do you think economic theory would tell you about that? I gave you the answer earlier. You should. I, I, should, I should it to you. Yeah. Those areas that were beaten down, right? 32% appreciation in the D rated or red shaded neighborhoods, right? That's phenomenal uh, growth there. 19.6% uh, in the yellow shaded neighborhoods, right? Every, every part of Lynchburg is experiencing price appreciation, right? But it's just exploding <coughs> right here. And so what's interesting about that is that if, if that were affecting everybody equally in those former red shaded neighborhoods, that would probably be a good thing. That's good for them to have their property values go up. Right, that gives them collateral for going, you know, maybe to get you know, a business loan or, or whatever. You, you can borrow against your home, send your kid to college. But let me show you this statistic right here. Less than 50% of homes in those current, right, the, the current neighborhoods that were once red shaded, less than half of those are owner occupied. Barely 50% in the yellow shaded neighborhoods were owner, owner occupied. Right? So, all that appreciation is not necessarily going to those people that are living there. They, the appreciation might be going to distant landlords. Okay, so um, is economic, uh, you know, is economic theory going to suggest that all that home appreciation is going to sort of guide Lynchburg into maybe some more equal prosperity? Yes, homes in those rich shaded neighborhoods—they're cashing up. But is it going to benefit everybody equally? That that remains to be seen. We can't we can't uh, guarantee that. Um, solutions to the affordability problem, right? So you got folks at the the low end who maybe still can't afford the homes in their neighborhood that are getting flipped, right? Homes are getting flipped right and left. Say in Daniel's Hill, all you got to do is just drive around and see all this home flipping going on there. Uh, can folks who live in Daniel's Hill necessarily afford those flipped and, and improved homes? Not necessarily. So there are solutions out there. Not everybody thinks these are good ideas, but these are many of the ideas that are out there. So some would say we need to eliminate snob and exclusionary zoning, things that require that you've got to have, and California just did this, that you've got to have a parking space to go with uh, an apartment in downtown LA, for example. Um, or that you, you can't have you know, you can't turn your garage into uh, an extra living space, or you've got to have three acres to a single family home, all those kinds of things that are designed to make a home more exclusive. Then there's some that say, if you're gonna build a new neighborhood, right, you need to uh, have inclusionary, instead of exclusionary uh, zoning that excludes people, you need to have inclusionary zoning that says, you know, some units here in this, uh, housing development, the yellow ones here, they've got to be made affordable to average folks, okay? So the remaining units are at the market rate. Allow up zone, right? Some places just put like a cap either on how high you can build a building or how much growth there could be. Boulder, Colorado is a wonderful place if, uh, if you've got money, but if you don't, they're not allowing, uh, you know, any expansion out into the uh, the county, and you certainly can't build up very much, so places like that become unaffordable. So the, the final thing I would say here, and I've got other slides I could share, but it's time for questions. Here's a map of Lynchburg's, uh, Lynch, Lynchburg's zoning map. So this, this Boonesboro area I keep referring to, notice that it's got the lightest color for the widest swath of all of its census tracts here, right? That's R1 low density residential. Um, <coughs> Here's the area we've been kind of referring to as the urban core, right, all the way up into Daniels Hill and down into James Crossing and uh, over into uh, Deerington, all this. Notice all the colors, all the different kind of uh, commercial zoning and higher intensity residential zoning, that kind of thing. So uh, some would say that, uh, you know, if you want to really make housing affordable, that you need to begin to address the zoning problem. So that might be a good place to stop, and uh, I, I hope I've left some time for questions. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so okay, much. Yes. So um, go ahead. We'll just be informal. So uh, raise your hand or, or chip in. And
Yes, ma'am. What is your opinion of why Lynchburg has such a high poverty rate and has over the years been higher than the state? Well, I, I think with some of what we've covered tonight, the, the red line, you go back to that legacy of slavery. Not, not every city in, in Virginia can speak of that 40% uh, you know, ownership of slaves. And uh, there, there was the impact of you know, the Jim Crow laws here. I mean, Lynchburg was, in fact, a, a slave trading center. And I think some of that stuff has sort of lingered. Okay? You look at Richmond statistics. Of course, Richmond is known way better than Lynchburg as a slave trading place. Uh, Richmond statistics are, are worse than, than Lynchburg's. So I think there, there's a bit of a legacy there that's in place. Um, uh, beyond that, um, some would say that you know we're sort of stuck here in this kind of a sleepy town without the <coughs> interstate system that runs through. When you've got an interstate system, it brings better jobs. And it brings more jobs, higher tech jobs, right? Uh, you know, Google is not going to make a decision ever to relocate in Lynchburg. They might make a, location, a decision to locate in at, you know, Atlanta or New York or something like that. So we're sort of stuck in a sort of a slow uh, job growth setting here. In fact, I, if you wanted to kind of further answer your question, you sort of indirectly, a very final slide here. It was a complicated one. But the red line here, the red line is employment. Notice that back in 2008, all right, uh, employment peaked up around 55, 56,000 right on the eve of the so-called Great Recession, okay? And then we lost just an enormous amount of jobs. We lost something like 5,000 jobs just in two years. And we've never made up all those jobs completely. We grew up into 2018, um, what do we, we actually uh, increased jobs by 2,230, but then, we lost another round okay, uh, from 2018 to 2021. And even though there's a slight uptick <clears throat> in the most recent year, actually that's just a single quarter of 2022 uh, there, we're still short. We're short relative to 2008, over 6,000 jobs. So we're, we're in a community that just is not a good job creator right now. And, and w without that dynamic job kind of a um, creating ability here, that doesn't speak well for pushing the poverty rate a little bit lower. Yeah, John, you alluded to part of the answer in your talk when you, when you talked about um, the lingering effects of redlining, and one of them, a very important one actually, is, the, is, is that redlining and the policies around that uh, prevented the accumulation of generational wealth. Yeah. Um, and and when, when your population is, you know, 35% uh, or whatever it is, 39% uh, African American, and, and that impairment of the accumulation of generational wealth makes, you know, keeps poverty in place. I mean, it doesn't, it, it, you can't fight it. Yeah, I, you put it better than I did myself. That, that's exactly right. So again, I was trying to make the point about sort of cementing into place. So think about it this way. If you can't get a loan in your own community because the banks will not make a loan to you because the federal government will not come along and guarantee that loan, then you can't upgrade your own, prop, your own property but you're not wanted out in the new neighborhoods that are coming up, like Levittown or uh, you know, out in the Boonesboro area. So you're sort of stuck. You're cemented into place. And so that just leads to the, the lack of the generational wealth. And so that most certain, that's, that's really the upshot of you know, the long-term effects of red line. So thanks for you know, making me clarify that, yes. Have any government initiatives made a dent in any of this? I'm thinking specifically of something like the Community Reinvestment Act. Mm -hmm. Maybe, um, I, I know that was, as much as anything, almost a punitive approach to the bankers to Well, the bankers needed that little shot in the arm to sort yeah. of force them to, you know, 
show, here's what we're doing to address this problem. Um, you know, the, the Fair Housing Act of 1968 was obviously a, a move in the right direction. It finally, it, it was like the last little piece that said all that stuff that we've been doing for all those years, you know, all these racially restrictive covenants, you cannot do that, period. There was another piece to that that never got really addressed until the Obama era, and that was the second half of, or the second piece of the uh, Fair Housing Act, and that was the so-called uh, affirmatively furthering piece of the whole thing, and that was designed to try to break down some of these racial barriers and to try to actually create a society that looked a little bit more like, uh, you know, what, what the whole society looked like. You know, neighborhoods could become more integrated, but nobody ever took action on that. Obama was beginning to make some progress with that, taking some steps uh, to make that happen. We were making taking some steps here in Lynchburg to implement the affirmatively further, furthering uh, part of the uh, Fair Housing Act. Trump came along, and you folks may remember the rhetoric about, you know, designed to, you know, appeal to, uh, you know, suburban housewives. We're, we're not going to allow those people to move into your neighborhoods, right? Just, you know, scaring people to death. And in one fell swoop, he basically just ripped out the funding of the affirmatively furthering clause of the Fair Housing Act, and, and that was the end of it. And uh, I suppose Biden maybe learned his political lesson and has, hasn't dealt with it yet. So, yes, sir. This uh, recent thing where people were evicted because of the lack of repairs and so forth in the apartment house, how does this fit in here? Uh, well, I'm thinking of, I don't know, th think of Virginia Hotel, right? That was a place that uh, you know, ha housed 70 or so people or families or whatever, and uh, it had been allowed to degrade. That's part of that cementing into place, that ancient and decrepit infrastructure. Right, that was a fine hotel at one time. It fell out harder and harder times. And so uh, when, you know, the developers came along and assessed uh, that, you know, this might be a, a property worth developing, uh, those people who lived there didn't really have any place to go. They just kind of had to kind of, you know, they got kind of placed here and there within the community. Uh, so, uh, you know, establishments like that are, you know, that's an example of, um, you know, the fact that there was no government programs to, you know, sort of force, you know, the owners of, of that property to, you know, bring it up to standards. Uh, it was just allowed to, you know, turn into a place with bed bugs and unsafe living conditions. Um, so, the government clearly could do more. Lynchburg's city government could probably do more. You know, the, the inclusionary zoning is if there's nothing preventing that except perhaps political willpower, right? That could happen here. Yes, ma'am. Um, what impact has the development of uh, lofts downtown? Has that helped? Lofts? Right. Uh, well, it, it has brought a lot of business activity back downtown. There's a lot of folks that live there. Um, when you go look at the original Hulk maps, kind of tying this back into the original subject matter, um, the downtown business district was not actually part of any of the red or yellow shading or any of that. Okay, it was actually left out. So when I actually sort of put data together and say, here's poverty, here's poverty, there, uh, I don't include the downtown business district. Now, for a while, uh, I did, and the numbers were always very volatile. Uh, the poverty rates downtown 10 or more years ago were actually pretty high, and they appear to be going down pretty quickly, right? So I think the, the loft apartments are beginning to probably push out the last of folks who were, you know, down there in you know, sort of low-income housing areas, not, not, not formal low-income housing, but just some of the lower-income residents. There's just not as many properties down there as there used to be. Almost every, from what I can tell, almost every piece of available property down there is spoken for. All those uh, you know, tobacco warehouses and what have you, uh, shoe warehouses, all those kinds of things. So um, it's becoming a much more well-to-do part of town, for sure. Yes, sir. So, John, one, thank you for some fascinating figures, but just to clarify what you just said about uh, the percentage growth in, in D, you know, we saw the increase. 
that did or did not include the uh, the downtown business area where the law was. That does not. Okay. Uh, so those no, those numbers that. go back to that business I was talking <coughs> about where I get my my mouse cursor and I go very carefully around each of the D rated neighborhoods. And so there were no, none of the downtown business districts were part of any of that D rating. You, you can just see that it's sort of left out. Um, and you know, back then, I guess it was, well, I, I can't say exactly who in the 1930s lived exactly where in, in that downtown area, but uh, it was not part of the red line. Uh, so yes, 32% is, you know, the Diamond Hills and the, uh, the Daniels Hills, and College Hill, uh, Garland Hill, all that. So, yes, ma'am. Have you compared any figures, or do you have any figures for um, uh, the schools in the city and um, assistance in uh, lunch plans and breakfast plans, that kind of thing, versus your your statistics for um, poverty level? I used to do that, and I no longer do it because they changed the rules about that. That used to be a really good barometer of uh, what was going on in the neighborhood. And you know, some of the schools in the poor neighborhoods had 100% uh, you know, free or reduced price lunches. Right. Well, at some point, the, the rules changed, and most kids suddenly, you know, uh, well-to-do or not, were, you know, had access to uh, free or reduced price lunches. And so, the, so it's like you start to look at the numbers for the schools, it's like they're all close to 100% or something. And so the, the numbers didn't seem to provide the, the rich story that they used to. Mm -hmm. I, I'm still not convinced that every kid that goes gets a free lunch, but when you talk to the people who administrate the lunch programs, they, can't, they can no longer tell you, um, you know, kind of like, like how many poor kids versus rich kids or whatever are receiving you know, free or reduced price lunches. That's, that's my understanding of it. Mm -hmm. So I, I gave up on that some while ago. Mm -hmm. so the answer to your question is no, not to my knowledge. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Well, just speaking to her, uh, ten, 10 years or so ago, <coughs> schools or people, people were encouraged to sign up for the free lunch. And, and now <coughs> it's just all over. Yeah. It's, all, it's all inclusive, so everybody yeah. gets it. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's my understanding. So, you know, when you, when you look at the numbers, they're, they're just, they don't tell a story. Anymore. Yeah, it doesn't mean anything anymore. Yeah. Anybody else? Now's your chance to. <laughs> now, the thing about with your 33, 32% there, uh, people that live downtown have their homes or people that rent. They're having to pay more in taxes because of that, because of the increase in value. But one, one thing to say about this, perhaps while I've got this back up here, uh, any, any statistic you see is always going to be an average of something. Mm -hmm. That 32% is an average of a bunch of growth rates of, I don't know, 1,100 or so properties. Mm -hmm. So you've got a significant portion of those properties, maybe 20%, that are actually experiencing property decreases, right? Property mm -hmm. value decreases. So from negative to maybe zero, you've got another 10 or 20 percent that are earning very low rates of appreciation. Then you can go to the upper end that ends up making up the 32 percent, and there you get fantastic appreciation. These are the ones that bought a home maybe for 15000 and turned around and sold it for 80000 or maybe now buy a home for 40000 sell it for one eighty or, or something, right? Those are the ones that are making up to a thousand percent appreciation. So the average ends up being 32 percent. Okay, but this is not selling, this is assessed. This is assessed, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it does reflect, again, the, the growth rate from, from 20 to 22. I, I wish I had numbers going way back. These are hard numbers to pull out. So from 20 to 22, uh, and that's not this kind of exciting period, exciting depending upon your perspective. This period, and, and tw the, the numbers for 2020, by the way, they're sort of like a year, uh, a year lag. So what you're really looking at here is from right before COVID 
until in the middle of COVID. So I'm talking about a two year stretch here when people are starting to panic and you know people are wanting to, uh, you know, maybe they've got extra savings, they're wanting to buy a home, and we get into this, you know, if I don't buy a home now, you miss out and, and you, know, you get into all this. So this is where a lot of that action has taken place, right there. But again, it's unequal. So if you look at the median, uh, the median is the middle number. I don't understand the statistical difference between a median and a mean. The, the median growth rate, it's still sizable, it's 11%, but it's not 32%. So the number in the middle is a little <coughs> bit more res uh, respective of what's really going on in the D-rated neighborhoods. But the average is 32%. And in a statistical analysis I did, this was the only collection of neighborhoods where this was statistically significant. Uh, so this is this is where the action has been for the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you. Well, if you'd like to um, have a little bit of you know one-on-one -on -one questions or anything like that, I'm sure um, John will uh, be generous generous with his time. Um, we will close probably around 20 minutes or so, but um, go ahead and help yourself to something to eat.